report on the Okay, so welcome to quarterly conversations. We're going to jump right into it here. So we're going to cover uh, a few things today, uh, mostly mostly walking through uh, latest market commentary, which was sent out uh, last week. If if you didn't see it come across, um, you know, let us know. We can send you the link. But but these topics shouldn't be anything new. Uh, we're mostly going to be talking about inflation here and what to do about it. Uh, so we've seen, you know, no pun, well, pun somewhat intended, inflated numbers, 13-year highs, in fact. So the CPI from one year ago, 5.4% uh, rise in June, a 5% rise in May. Um, since seen a little bit of a, of a backtrack on that, but, uh, you know, these numbers are, are, are pumped up and PPI, producer price index from one year ago, a 7.3% rise in June. Um, CPI is probably fairly a uh, fairly familiar term to most of you, consumer price index. <clears throat> pretty straightforward. The price consumers pay for goods. PPI, producer price index, may not be uh, quite as familiar. Uh, that is the price that businesses are paying uh, for, their, uh, for their raw materials, uh, for producing producer price index for producing uh, goods. So uh, Warren Buffett was actually quoted uh, more specifically as, as uh, uh, alluding to the fact that the PPI has been um, aggressively increasing and that they're seeing that in a lot of their business lines. So, but we'll dig into that a little bit more. And then uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about, about what to do about it. Um, you know, whether or not it's, it is a big concern, um, or if it's just transitory, which seems to be kind of the word of the day. Um, and yeah, so let's, let's go from there. So we've been hearing about inflation for a long time now, probably better part of a, probably better part of the decade, um, because it has been so low. Uh, and the question this time, we're, you know, we're seeing some, some real numbers, some real big spikes. Uh, and the question is, is inflation just a pump fake? Uh, and I think that there are really two sides of this coin and kind of a case to be made for, for both of them. Uh, and that is whether or not there will be sustained inflation uh, or if there will be transitory inflation. Uh, and I think there are, are, you know, a couple of things to keep in mind when we think about sustained inflation. So, I mean, the easiest one is cash on the sidelines. Um, you know, we've, we've over the past 18 months had, uh, you know, more liquidity, more cash created than the entire financial crisis. There is a ton of cash out there. Um, supply, uh, you know, this is, Pretty, a pretty common conversation that we are having uh, with, you know, clients, friends, other, other professionals. Um, you know, the real estate market is, is obviously really hot right now. There just aren't enough houses to meet demand. Um, same with used vehicles, which is uh, a, a pretty uh, uh, common indicator for where inflation is going. So it's a classic case of, of too much cash, chasing too few goods, um, it's, it's going to create, create inflation 10 times out of 10. The question is, is that going to uh, endure uh, or is it, is it simply, is it transitory? And I think the case for it being transitory is, you know, really, I guess, twofold. One is that, you know, interest rates have been near zero forever. So if inflation does start to run away, there's a ton of room for rates to, to aggressively increase and choke off that inflation growth. Um, you know, which I, I think is, is a, probably a direct contrast to, uh, you know, everybody, when, when you think about inflation, you think about the 1970s, um, probably a direct contrast to that, because back in the 70s, you could actually get yield, uh, whereas today there's no yield out there. So the fact that we have room to run for interest rates is, um, actually the case that, you know, inflation could be combated if it started to run away. Um, the other piece is that 
the cheap money policies are starting to run out and they're going to start to wane those policies. And the question is, what does that do to the labor market, which has been uh, incredibly tight as of late? And we have a couple of statistics to look at there. Um, but once that cheap money starts to, to, you know, come out of the economy and the labor market starts to turn around, um, you know, th th there's kind of a twofold uh, uh, case there, which could be that, uh, you know, inflation turn, you know, returns to normal uh, if that cheap money starts to bleed out of the, you know, out of out of pockets and, and stops chasing the reduced supply or, you know, the flip side is that that could easily be up under the case for sustained inflation, which is if you get wage inflation, that will also contribute. So, you know, this is yet to be seen. I think there's a good case to be made for either of these. Um, and, you know, the question becomes, how, how do we uh, how do we prepare for them? Do you have anything to add to that, Rick? I, I kind of I kind of bulldozed through that slide. <laughs> no, you did. You did a good job. You um, did a good job. We'll talk about that on the next slide a little bit further though in more detail okay. um so when you talk about inflation you talk about cpi and the cpi increasing and um when you talk about the cpi's consumer price index is 147 components to the compute to the to the consumer price index but there are eight major groups um to that to the cpi and we're going to talk about the three largest groups and those three largest groups are housing, transportation, and food and beverage in that order, housing being the number one. So when you see the CPI inflating um, and you, you see the housing market inflating, you, see, you, you can see why the CPI is going up. Um, but you know, when, you, when you talk about transitory inflation, this should be short-lived. And they, you know, we, we had a, a housing pop when, um, um, when we first uh, came out of, of the, um, the COVID lockdown i guess you'd say and i guess it's like taking a herd of wild animals and sticking them in a pen and smushing them close together letting them sit there for a little while and then opening the gates and letting them all take off and then they just all go all over the place so with housing um you know that that actually increased quite a bit but let's talk about let's let's start with the backwards and move forwards. let's talk about food and beverage um food and beverage uh, is increased quite a bit we've all seen that going to the store um, a lot of that has been caused by the disruption in the supply chain um, and also transportation. Um, you know, when the, when, the, when, when the supply chain does have it available, the transportation to uh, the stores is, has been slow, um, mainly because we have a shortage of truckers. Um, but that, that causes the, the price of food to go up. Um, and, and, you know, you, you tend to... Um, you tend to see that increase actually not come down. Once they start increasing the price of food, um, the price of food doesn't tend to come down. Um, they tend to keep it at the same level. But when you also look at um, the food and beverage side, uh, you're also seeing the, the, um, the, um, the dining, outdoor dining and, 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 and dining in general, where we're, everybody was pent up for so long they went back into the market um, and, and everybody's going back out to, to eat meals. So we went out last night and there was, there was crowds of people on a Wednesday night um, that were flooding the diners and the restaurants. And, um, and it's not typical on a Wednesday night. And a lot of what we're seeing too is, is encouragement to come back out on a Sunday night by uh, instead of offering live bands on a, on a Friday and Saturday night, they start offering them on a Sunday night to encourage people back out on uh, at that point. But what you're seeing also, and as we go to every restaurant we go to, we see help wanted signs. So the cost of that labor is starting to go up and we'll touch on that a little bit later, but um, also pushes the prices of just going out to meals um, um, higher. So again, is that going to be short lived? Um, you know, you, you, you tend not to get that back when food and beverage goes up. Um, when you look at transportation, um, Dan and I were talking about it a couple of days ago, and I've been talking about it with several clients in, in, in past meetings, um, the auto industry. Um, you know, we can understand the, the airfare and the airfare going back up because when, when, the air, uh, when, tra when, when travel opened back up, everybody jumped on a plane and they didn't have enough pilots to be able to transport people back and forth. So the cost of the airfare went up. 
Um, and we know that's a commodity and, and that typically tends to come back down. But um, you also look at auto prices and uh, more specifically, you, d- you dive into the um, used car sales. Used car prices have gone up drastically. Uh, a lot of that was caused by um, the, um, the uh, shipment of the chips to the new autos, to the new, to the new car companies. The uh, chip market has not made it back quite yet. Um, in full scale to be able to get the, the computer chips, main computer chips to run the cars. Um, so the supply of cars is just sitting there waiting for these computer chips. We also see this a lot in, um, in um, the sale of, um, of um, RVs, especially Class A, Class C RVs, um, still waiting on those chips. Um, but then you also see the housing market. And the housing market, um, we had a flood of people coming into the housing market because it was put on hold at the major part of the, the, um, the um, market. When, when, when everybody goes out searching for houses in March, looking to transfer, transition into a new house in March, April, May, June timeframe, it was put on hold. And then we had everybody going back out looking for houses in addition to those coming that, de- that during COVID decided they wanted to leave the cities. And then you get the, the, the herd mentality right behind them. Go back to that other slide, Dan. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it's, it starts to push up the housing prices. The big question is, is our, um, and Dan, I don't know if you want to step back in into the auto section or talk about any of those other pieces before I step into the um, housing prices. Yeah, well, I was just gonna, I was just gonna give some context on that. Use, use auto, uh, uh, Retail price of used autos was up ten and a half percent from May to June, um, just to give some some context to those numbers. So it's a big piece of of why we saw inflation jump, um, you know, and pent up demand is 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 really really the reason. Um, and again, ton of cash, yeah, ton of cash, definitely. not enough used cars. It's it's gonna pop. So. But you know, the the point of this slide, and 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 Rick, I you know, I want you to keep keep going here. You're on a roll, uh, with, with housing. It's, it's, uh, clearly what w- the, the point, the point we're trying to get across here is what trend are we looking at? We're we looking at the long-term trend or the short-term trend. Transitory or not transitory to be or not to be is the big question. Um, so when you look at this chart, this particular chart shows a long-term trend of the housing market. And I always, when I explain the housing market to, to clients and, and, uh, and other individuals that, um, that have an interest, I tend to um, look at the long-term aspects because housing market tends to go up really quick. It, it drops really quick and then levels off for a long period of time. And you can see that trend here coming out of the 90s. Um, we just dropped off and kind of leveled off for a long period of time into, into 2000. Um, And then we were in a period of of, um, slow growth in the market, slow growth in the economy, 2000 after 9-11, after the break in the in the in the technical market in the technic in the technic not the technicals but in the technology market back in 2000, um, everything tended to 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 slow down a bit. But then all of a sudden we had a spike and just um, the the encouragement of everybody should own a house the the, the free money availability pushed that market way up. And um, some of what I'm going to be talking about in a couple of minutes is new housing starts. But new housing starts fueled that. And um, the availability of money fueled that. You can see where it jumped in, in um, you know, up all the way to 2007 and, and tended to drop pretty aggressively. Uh, and then where are we going? We're going back up again. And um, 2000. 10, 11, 12, after, after 2012, that market started inching up and now we're getting fairly aggressive. Now, if you see that long red line, um, you see where it ends, uh, that's, that's your long-term trend. So are we high right now? The housing market has probably gone a little bit higher than it should. Uh, there's certain areas that, are, that, that, will, that will drop further than other areas. But what we're going to see is we're going to see um, probably another fuel in housing starts. And this is something to keep an eye on. If if we're seeing long-term inflation, 
you'll see a, a large amount of housing starts. And when those housing starts go, they start increasing and increasing. And you see a big jump in the housing starts, then you might see a larger, longer term inflationary uh, situation. Because not only are housing prices, um, the availability of housing coming back onto the market, but we gotta, we gotta, we gotta load those houses with stuff. Um, we got white goods, we got, um, you know, all different things that we're decorating the houses with. But you know, when you get those new houses on board, you'll see the current use sale market of houses start to open up a little bit more and you'll see those prices start to level off. But where real inflation comes in is when you see the, the new housing market start to increase quite aggressively. I think in aggregate, a good uh, perspective to have on this is if you kind of if you look at the peak right before the shaded areas are recessions here. If you look at the peak right before, oh, let's see what just happened there. You switched this to the next slide. Go. If you look at the peak right before the financial crisis. We're close to that uh, that 400 line there on the index on the on the very far left <clears throat> where we are now up here where this you know long-term arrow trend ends off uh if, if you bought your house right before the the financial crisis to right now it, that's you, you're talking about over a decade over a decade and your your housing, you, you, the price of your house is only up about twenty percent, right? So the question is, you know, what are we anchoring to when we think about how expensive real estate is? We tend to have, you know, a little bit of recency bias, and um, you know, we look at how much housing prices have skyrocketed in the past year, eighteen months, five years. Um, but when you look at the longer term trend, it, it actually isn't quite as dramatic uh, as, as, you might, uh, as you might believe. Uh, so the question is, you know, as Rick pointed out with housing starts and in the context of inflation, there may still be some room to run with housing prices when you look at that longer term trend, even though... Uh, you know, sometimes from a common sense perspective, we look at what's happened recently and we say, no, I, they can't keep going up. Um, but what, that, is, that is yet to be seen because they may not be quite as expensive as you think. They're, yeah, it's, you're, you're not quite as expensive as you think because housing, housing, housing prices actually started to peak above 2007 just over the last 18 months. We were yeah. talking about the last 18 months. If you shorten up that, that, um, that line just just 2015 to 2021, you'll see a dramatic increase over the last 18 months. So, but housing prices, if they if they do fall, they don't have a long uh, a long drop or a large drop. So, housing prices, I would say that I think that we're in we're in a decent um, level where we are where we should be in housing prices. Although it is a little high, but it's it's not too expensive. So, if you're looking if you're looking at housing prices dropping drastically like they did in 2007, remember it's not 2007. We don't have a a, a huge run on on new housing starts. We don't have the money availability like we had. Although we we do have a lot of cash on the street, but the free money availability we don't have yet. Um, well, that's the point. We got a lot of cash. We don't have a lot of leverage. And that's a leverage. Exactly. Uh, so here's here's what we're here's what we're looking at. I mean, and this is a big question. Mark, Rick and I were talking about this the other day. Um, you know, tip it, typically when you have sustained inflation, there is a component of wage inflation to that. Um, you know, transitory inflation or, or almost like synthetic or fabricated inflation uh, you know, makes sense when you flood the market with with cash, which is what all the policymakers have uh, have been doing. Uh, so, but there's two there's two pieces here. We just we just wanted to touch on quickly uh, as we as we play armchair economist. Uh, so, on the left, labor force participation. This is not unemployment rate. This is labor force participation rate. Um, and on the right, average hourly earnings. So, they put two blue 
arrows on these just to point out i mean it's it's pretty clear uh where those where the 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 drop off and the corresponding spike occurred was exactly when guess what uh qe infinity quantitative easing infinity when they said we're going to uh, print as much money as, as we can imagine, you know, as however high numbers go, we're just going to start doing that. Um, this is what happened. I mean, the labor force participation rate dropped off. We know, you know, uh, uh, you know, stimulus programs, unemployment benefits, uh, uh, you know, uh, were around for, you know, much longer than a lot of, a lot, a lot of policymakers had originally intended. Um, and it did two things. It, you know, it, it, it created a, a tight labor market and it, and it picked up uh, average hourly earnings o- almost, almost immediately. Um, so, you know, the big que- the reason that this is a question mark is because what happens when that stimulus stops? You know, will, will, the, will both of these charts sort of revert, uh, you know, back to the normal trend line? Uh, will the labor market, uh, you know, cease being uh, so tight, um, you know, and will uh, will wage inflation sort of, uh, you know, level off uh, as opposed to, you know, companies continuing to pay more and more to, to have a competitive wage to, you know, hire skilled workers. Um, and, you know, the, the stimulus has a lot to do with that. So, you know, and I think the key, the key piece to that, Dan, in, in long term inflation is increasing in wages and seeing hourly wages go up and seeing um, wages go up and competitiveness um, amongst them work amongst workers and the encouragement of of higher wages to be able to get them to come to work there. Um, that's that's really the piece that fuels inflation, because that really is more more real money in the market, more long term money following off, following the uh, the buying of stuff. to Keep right. that CPI index going. Right. It's funny. It's funny. You say real money. I just I want to get this in there now before we get to the to the rest of this. So. Um, wage inflation creates a continuous source of new capital for consumers to spend, right? So that, you know, the case for sustained, uh, you know, consumer price inflation, you know, comes from wages in the traditional economic sense. Traditional economics do not apply when you have central banks flooding the markets with cash. Well, I guess, Traditional economics do apply, but the source of the funds is uh, is obviously not what you would typically think. Usually, you don't have just markets flooded with cash like this. The reason I say that is this: uh, if you read the letter, I, I referenced uh, the FDIC has said that more than two trillion dollars, with a T, is currently in individual bank accounts, meaning. These are not the assets of, of major financial institutions. These, these are not the assets of corporations. These are not the assets of uh, you know, government entities or anything like that. $2 trillion in American savings accounts that they are just waiting to spend. And the reason that's important is because while wage inflation can create an ongoing source of capital, the question is, well, what happens if you already have the capital to spend? How long is that runway for that $2 trillion to get spent to the point where Americans don't feel anymore like they have a ton of excess cash? And I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to revisit that uh, in, a, in a little bit, but um, this is wage inflation is a huge question mark for, for us because you know, we, we see it traditionally as creating big inflation uh, and sustained inflation, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's possible the Federal Reserve uh, may have done a ready, fi- uh, ready fire aim on this and, and create a little too much money. Um, <laughs> you think? I do think, and actually, I'm glad you said that because uh, think, uh, believing in inflation is actually a big part of it. So, uh, Two two things I want to talk about. So, 
the market implied probability of inflation. Uh, futures markets are suggesting uh, that investors believe inflation will be above 3% in the next five years. There's a huge spike in the market implied probability, which essentially is uh, futures options bets that inflation will go up. Uh, the FOMC, Federal Open Market Committee, uh, in their meeting minutes, actually from, from just from this week, uh, they stated that inflation is on track to moderately exceed, whatever the heck that means, 2% for some time. 2% is important. That is actually the Fed's inflation target. And so the Fed is actually acknowledging, hey, we, we think inflation is actually going to exceed our target for some time, year, five years. I, I don't know what some time is, but they, they keep these minutes uh, intentionally vague. Uh, but they believe that inflation is, is, is here to stay, albeit close to their target. So if you, you know, if you look at all the headlines, the uh, transitory inflation, uh, the reason that you're seeing that is because most policymakers, uh, economists, analysts, et cetera, uh, see the headline inflation spikes at, you know, five, six, seven percent. And they say, no, 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 no. This isn't here to stay. We're gonna, we're gonna be around two percent, maybe between two to three percent, and and that's gonna be where it'll stay. Which, and this is just my opinion. Well, that's fine. That's our target. But, but guess what? Over the past ten years, we've had zero. So when you go from zero to two or three, that can be a big jump. Um, and the question is, you know, in conversations we're having with with clients, friends, other professionals, etc. Uh, when everyone sort of believes that there's going to be inflation and you start to see the green shoots of inflation, whether it's transitory or sustained, whether the economics support it or not, the question becomes how much does the belief that there is going to be inflation, the evidence that there currently is inflation, and being armed with the cash to spend today... <clears throat> To combat against that perceived inflation, it would suggest that there will continue to be more and more inflation. Now, I'm not saying that we're going to stay at five, six percent, but I do think that when you consider all those factors, it suggests to me that the Fed is probably tempering uh, their rhetoric when they say moderately exceed two percent for some time. I think, I think there's a lot of reasons to believe that. Inflation is going to inflation is going to be well above their target for 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 a while here, uh, and the question is, you know, are wages going to support that, or is all the cash they pumped into the economy going to be the thing that supports that? Um, any anything else on inflation, Rick? I feel like we we beat a dead horse here. Yeah, I just have one other thing. You mentioned yeah. Ma Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point. I thought that was a great intro into um, talking about this because you ultimately could have, and this is the reason why I say keep an eye on the indicators, you ultimately could have a tipping point when it comes to um, a lot of cash being on the market, being out there on the market. People, um, economists ultimately believing it, it is transitory, ultimately could lead into long-term inflation. So yeah. it's important to keep an eye on those indicators and watch where those indicators go, because that tipping point can culminate when, when, when there is a lot of cash out there. And then all of a sudden wage inflation kicks up and it just yep. keeps it going from there. Yep. So, and I actually, I have a question here. Um, and I, I, I love this question. I don't know who put it in. It says anonymous, but I love this question. Uh, wage increases keep the current workforce current. I'm thinking that means, you know, in line with inflation, but what happens to the retiree who is on a fixed income? I love that question because we we are going right into that. So um, I appreciate the segue. Um, the last question I had here on on the on the on the uh, on the on the slide. What does this say about the stock market? Uh, you know, I think belief plays into that too. Most people we talk to believe the market is overvalued. We talked a little about bit about real estate prices, but you know, stock prices. Most people believe that most investors believe the stock market is overvalued. 
So when you ha believe, when you have a fear of inflation, a belief of inflation, a lot of cash sitting on the sideline, the belief the market is overvalued, you know, one thing we would definitely uh, expect to happen is when you see some of these spikes, we think there's going to continue to be a lot of volatility in the market because we think that, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of worry out there. However, to paint a little bit of a rosier picture, any, uh, any correction to the downside we get, since there is so much cash on the sidelines, it would suggest that that cash would readily be deployed back into those assets. So we're likely to see a lot of like whipsawing in the market, we think, with, uh, with prices moving up and down with a ton of liquidity uh, and a general belief that inflation is coming and, and, uh, and the market's overvalued. So um, question is, we're all buy and hold investors, or I hope we are everyone on the call because you're, you're listening to us. Um, we're all buy and hold investors. So, so what do we do? Um, so the inflation trade, there's, there's a ton of articles, a ton of noise out there right now about what do you do to prepare your portfolio for inflation? What does the retiree do who's taking an income that needs to keep up with inflation and it's eroding your purchasing power uh, in an environment where you cannot get yield on bonds. Um, and in fact, if you were to buy, you know, bond funds, interest rates going up, inversely correlated, downward pressure on price, buying an individual bond, you might protect your principal, but you're getting no yield. So you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't on, on bonds. So the flavors of the week uh, on the inflation trade or the you know the sort of the hot topics here uh bitcoin is 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 getting its time in the limelight um in fact I, I think i learned more about bitcoin than i really wanted to but um bitcoin uh i don't know fanboys for lack of a better term uh are getting to explain what the investment thesis is behind bitcoin right now and the investment thesis behind Bitcoin goes something like this. There is a finite amount of Bitcoin that have been created. That's the way that the entire system was made. So when you have a finite supply, it is naturally an inflation hedge. Because when you have cash that is looking to be deployed into a particular asset, and that asset cannot be duplicated. Therefore, you have high demand, low supply, price goes up. So Bitcoin's investment thesis is it's an inflation hedge. I don't know if I buy it. Uh, I don't. Treasury, <laughs> I know Rick doesn't buy it. I don't buy it. But hey, you got Yeah, I guess if you believe in Bitcoin, one of the reasons to invest in it is you think it's an inflation hedge. Uh, PIPs, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, automatic adjustments with inflation. PIPs work really well if inflation is higher than we think it's going to be. And unfortunately, with the way inflation is moving right now, it's all over the place. So, you know, could be 2%, could be 5%. We don't know. Could be 3%, could be... 1%. And that's, and that's what we're not sure about. We think it's here to stay, but, but tips work really well when inflation adjusts more than what you think. Uh, commodities, naturally price sensitive. Oil tends to do well in an inflationary environment. Uh, I mean, the, you know, the old standby, gold. Gold bugs love when there's inflation chatter. And real estate, we talked about real estate. Anything that, you know, is a, is a, is a hard commodity that's, that's very price sensitive tends to work well and and inflationary environments. Here's the problem with all of these. Rick knows the problem with all of these. They're all really tactical. <laughs> really tactical. When when you know buy low, sell high is is obviously what we want to do. Um, but I said it at the beginning of the letter: do not eat yellow snow. Uh, so you know we don't want to we don't want to crowd our our uh, our investment process here with uh, trying to catch a falling knife. So I've heard that expression before. 
I've said it before. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so that's where we're, we want to talk again about boring dividend stocks, specifically in the context of inflation. I call it boring because, you know, the, these are stocks that typically, you know, in really grossy markets, they don't keep up with like your, your high flying tech companies. Uh, there's, there are companies that, that you've, uh, you've likely used their products. You, they've been around for 20 plus years. You've definitely heard of them. Um, but the reason that it works is, is a couple things. Number one, and Rick's going to talk about this a bit. They, they are dividend stocks are correlated and, and dividends in general are correlated with inflation expectations. Um, and this is a long term correlation between these types of stocks and, and their dividends. So the stocks who tend to benefit from price appreciation are dividend payers. We talked a little bit about bonds. Uh, you know, in the current interest rate environment, the dividend is, is somewhat like a bond proxy. So as long as you have a consistent dividend that does not get cut and a company with strong cash flow, you know, if you can collect a 3% dividend, uh, that's kind of like having a bond. And to answer the, the, the question of the, uh, that I have in the question and answer box here, collecting a dividend and dividend growth tends to be the way that retirees can combat inflation. Number one, not only because dividends tend to be correlated with inflation, but because those dividends, if you're, if you're buying the right companies with strong cash flow and a strong history of consistency, uh, you know, are paying the same dividend per share you know, quarter after quarter, year after year. Um, you know, and the other piece to, to, to realize is whenever value does better than growth, which I mean, growth has had its day in the limelight for the better part of the past, uh, decade, decade. Yeah. Since, since the financial crisis, really, um, you know, you would expect a, a, a bit of a reversion there, but you know, the point is whenever value outperforms growth, dividend stocks always outperform any other value stock. And of course, the thing we all go to is, again, what if the market is overvalued? So, so we always like to look at this, uh, the chart on the bottom here, uh, the financial crisis, the S&P 500. So, you know, broad basket of U.S. stocks down 57 percent, uh, dividend stocks. The way I like to say this is you are filling in a smaller hole with a bigger shovel. So it's a, a much, it's a bigger protection, again, especially for retirees. But I also like it for pre-retirees because it's a dollar cost averaging strategy when the market is down, as long as you're continuing to earn the same dividend. And really the compelling point is time to recovery. Um, you know, so when there's uncertainty in the market, uncertainty around inflation expectations, you know, our stocks overpriced. The time to recovery is really the important thing here. So, you know, if you were invested in the S&P 500, on the very top, right before the financial crisis, you wouldn't get back to where you were until about five and a half years. Uh, utilizing high quality dividend stocks, that chops down to about three years. So again, smaller hole, bigger shovel. Uh, Rick, you wanna talk about this? Yeah, I can talk about that. Um, basically, Dan mentioned about the, the correlation to dividend and uh, inflation. And you can see going back all the way to 1880, you had a direct correlation uh, to inflation and, and dividend paying stocks. Um, basically, the, um, the, the main point of this is, is when, when inflation happens, um, dividend stocks tend to go up, right? So you get the spread, you, you can see the spread on the last, on the right side of that chart on the left. Um, and there's a, there's a little bit of anomaly there because interest rates got so low that everybody decided to move towards what they call riskier stocks. When you look to balance a portfolio out, typically in the world today, we'd balance that portfolio out to get more conservative between bond stocks and cash. And um, cash would get a little bit greater, the bond side would get a little bit greater, and you lose a little bit of your return by reducing the amount of equity that you have in the portfolio. But what we do is, is when, when you get this inflationary hedge, um, you might lose a little bit uh, in the market when the market first shifts, but ultimately the most important part about dividends and dividend growing um, um, investments is your, your, your dividend constantly grows. 
So when we select a dividend portfolio, the most important thing we want to see, not just a dividend and a high paying dividend, but a dividend that's been paid for a long period of time, 25 years. And over that 25 years is a constant increase year over year of that dividend. So for the anonymous person that asked about what do we do with uh, retirees, we build your portfolio out a little bit more aggressively in the dividend market. We can, and, and, and in where the interest rate environment is today, we actually are cutting back a little bit on the, um, on, the, on the bond side of the portfolio because your risks lie when you have inflation, increasing interest rates, bond prices go down. Um, so we build that portfolio a little bit more on the dividend side of the, um, uh, of the, of the portfolio. And Dan, you can touch on that chart on the right a little bit more, but um, yeah, you know, 83% of the, the growth in dividend investments has really come, comes from the, um, the dividends or dividend stocks comes from the dividend themselves. But Dan, you can expand on that a little bit more. Well, I wanted to I wanted to point out. I mean, well, it's I mean, it's pretty clear from the chart on the left that you know, dividend growth and and inflation growth is 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 highly correlated. correlated um, which which is sort of the you know background information. But the the chart on the right, I mean, I think we have to remember. You know, usually when there's inflation, it means it means the economy is growing. So inflation itself, there's a reason the Federal Reserve has a has a target of two percent. It's because they they we want to see some inflation. Um, we just don't want to see runaway inflation that is, uh, you know, higher than it, than it, and higher than expected, uh, and continuing to get bigger in, in a way that, you know, can't be controlled. But the point is, is that, you know, I, you can't look at inflation as, oh, if there's inflation, it's a bad thing, because again, you have to remember that means the economy is growing and you can see, you know, correlation with inflation rolling 25 year period, if you just look at S&P 500 and earnings growth. So I am, I am looking here on this chart. So your S&P 500 returns and your earnings growth. It, it's a pretty strong correlation, right? Call it somewhere around 60% of, you know, stock market returns and, and, and earnings growth somewhere, you know, 60% about correlated with, with inflation. So it makes sense, right? It means, means the economy is growing, means companies are doing well. Uh, the, the point is, is that if, you know, we're at all concerned with the market being overvalued, if we're at all concerned about runaway inflation, if we're at all concerned about, um, you know, how do you get yield off of your bond portfolio or, you know, is there something we can replace that with? The important thing to realize is that dividend growth is much more highly correlated with inflation than the rest of the market. And that's why we think it's a, a really important part, really, for any investor to have in, in their portfolio at this point in time. Um, not to mention tax benefits of, of these dividend stocks because they are tax qualified dividends, meaning they are uh, taxed like capital gains, long-term capital gains. So um, well, max tax 15%, right? Uh, that is correct. So I don't think I see any any questions on dividends, but we're going to continue to monitor the chat box, the question box here, uh, and wrap up in a minute. I do want to just finish off with this. This is a, a and, and the reason, the reason I didn't put this in with the inflation stuff is simply because uh, there's, there's a lot going on here. Um, oops, but I wanted to make sure, oops, let me go back. Sorry about that. I uh, wanted to make sure we spent a little bit of time on this. So this is a, this is an interesting chart that, that just came about within the last quarter. Um, and what this chart really shows you is how much cash is actually still out there. So you can see the, the large increase right here from near zero up to one, about $1 trillion uh, since April. I think April, I believe it was April 5th to be exact, but um, I'll have to check myself on that. Uh, what this is is a chart 
of what they call reverse repos. So uh, what a reverse repo is, is the, is the inverse of a, of a repo, a repurchase agreement. And what that is, is it's kind of like a, a pawn shop for banks and other market makers. Uh, what, what they do is the Fed will, will take the, the treasury bonds or, or, or other bond type assets from these market makers and exchange them for cash with the promise to repo, repurchase. Uh, and the reason for this is, is it's just a short term demand loan where the Federal Reserve can call it. You have, you know, you have to repurchase it back, but it creates liquidity for the system. It creates liquidity for banks. It creates liquidity for for um, for market makers and, and, and you know, major financial institutions. Um, so I mentioned how, you know, individual savings accounts have about two trillion dollars stockpiled. What this shows is the reverse repo, which is the opposite, which is pawning cash for treasuries, meaning the bank basically says, hey, um, you know, we don't actually need cash from the Fed. What we need is we need to do the opposite. Uh, we need to take excess cash that we have uh, and we need to put a tr we need to buy a treasury because it'll, uh, you know, it'll give us some some interest. So. The reason for this spike is is what happened in April is the Federal Reserve said, hey, we'll, you know, we'll give you a 0.05%. And this is to you know major banks. We'll give you 0.05% uh, through a, through this re, you know reverse repo program we're setting up. Um, you know if you if you if you give us your cash, we'll give you this treasury, and and uh, you can re, you know we're, we'll tell you when we need to repurchase the cash. Essentially, is what happens. So you know the Fed is basically taking back cash that it created. But the point is this: is in short order, as you can see, over the course of three months. And this chart just completely spiked. So there was a trillion dollars of extra cash in 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 banks. So when you add the trillion dollars of extra cash in banks, plus the two trillion dollars in individual savings accounts, right there you're looking at three trillion dollars. Now the record for total cash, what this does not include. This cash does not include extra cash sitting on the balance sheet of major corporations, for example, extra cash sitting in investment brokerage accounts, extra cash, um, you know, sitting in, uh, you know, any, anything that falls out of the purview of savings accounts and just major banks. Uh, it does not include that. This is $3 trillion. The record for total cash was 3.8 trillion, which was back in January 09. Right now, when you add in all the other cash sitting with corporations and businesses, and, and if you go down the line, there's over $5 trillion of cash sitting on the sidelines. And this chart pretty much verifies that, that these major institutions just have cash sitting there and they are unwilling uh, to put that cash to use in really any risky asset. Um, interestingly enough, that tri $5 trillion number of cash sitting on the sidelines right now, that is actually the exact number of how much, how much stimulus was created. So the interesting thing here is we have come full circle. The stimulus was created, it kind of made its way through the system and is now sitting on balance sheets, savings accounts for individual investors, for banks, for institutions, for corporations. Um, and now the Fed is going to have to deal with what to do to sort of drain some of this extra cash out because it looks like most of the cash they created actually was never even used. And I think that this matters because what it says to us is that the major institutions are doing the same thing that we're all doing, which is being cautious with cash and it implies that inflation may be a bigger concern than some of the powers that be would like to admit. I told you that the Fed said, yeah, we'll moderately exceed 2% for a little bit. And this would, this would suggest that, you know, inflation is a real concern because there's a lot of cash hoarding going on. So at any rate, that, that's, that's my last piece. Uh, Rick, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that at all, but, um, I'm going to I'm going to move it to the last page here for questions. I'll look at the Q&A here and we got another question on board here. Oh, you got it. Okay. 
Uh, will the dollar remain in? Um, <laughs> will the dollar remain the international currency? <laughs> as 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 long as the as long as the U.S. is it remains the uh, dominant power, and everybody continues to use the dollar as a as an international currency, it will. The question is, is that's that 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 becomes the dark side of the world. What will happen next? Um, and that. Technically, Dan, unless you got another answer for this, I don't think that we can answer that question easily. I, I think, I think, yeah, I can't say yes or no, but I'll, 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 I'll you know, I'll, 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 I'll give you some color just for entertainment purposes. How about that? Uh, That's perfect. <laughs> uh, so here, here's, here's, here's like I don't know. Here's the bear case and the bull case. So the, the, the bull case to that is, uh the the us for all of our faults uh we are technically still the the most well capitalized major economy in the world and when it comes to being an international currency i talked about belief in inflation earlier when it comes to being an international currency you have to realize everyone's pegged to the number one and that represents a dollar so there's a lot a lot of trust involved in that. When there are issues overseas, whether they're geopolitical, whether they're uh, you know uh, uh, asset risk, meaning you know overpriced stock markets, whether it's you know <coughs> Japanese markets or Chinese markets or the eurozone or what have you, the U.S. Treasury is still, by and large, viewed as the safe haven asset. That trust is really hard to undermine. So I, that's that's kind of the bull case is that is that this is there you know uh, that's going to be a longer term trend that there's really there's nothing to suggest that that trust is being undermined there's nothing to suggest that um, uh, you know there would be a better international currency or other currencies being supported more and I actually there's a there's a chat here and I was. Al, this is great because I, this is, I, I love this. You're leading right into what I was about to say. Um, so the, the bear case, two, two things for the bear case. Number one, when, when, when the dollar is the peg, when we, meaning the, technically meaning the Federal Reserve, but when we, when the United States prints a ton of that money, what we are doing in essence is we are drawing on the credit of the rest of the world. We are hurting emerging market economies. Uh, we are really only, let's put it this way. We're only thinking about ourselves when we, when we create $5 trillion of stimulus and most of that cash is still sitting in the hands of us consumers, businesses, uh, financial institutions, et cetera. That is only benefiting us. That is benefiting no one else. In fact, it is benefiting us at the expense of many other economies. Let so me let me just add to that of this just in, um, because um, sometimes when 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 the tax man gets involved, things get encouraged. So to leave this on the minds of everybody, uh, there's a crypto surprise that rattled the industry today when the bipartisan tax plan added a focus on taxing cryptocurrencies. Um, they're gonna go after the brokers, the IRS is gonna go after the crypto brokers to start reporting sales and purchases of cryptocurrency. And, so, and crypto is, was, was part of the bear case that yeah. I wanted to talk about because the People's Republic of China in their infinite wisdom have decided to start doing a the, the very first state sponsored which you know that's what they do with everything but state state sponsored uh uh government backed digital coin um here's why that's important I, i'm not saying we couldn't do it i'm not saying the us couldn't couldn't do a cryptocurrency but i don't know if any of any, anybody here has ever noticed how it, the ach system you can't do, you know, electronic transfers on the weekends. Um, and how does that make sense? Because, you know, 
why co computers aren't closed on the weekends? Why do we still operate off of normal business hours um, for, you know, ACH transfers? It doesn't make any sense. The ACH system, as far as moving money around is, is still like, that's the primary system we use for, for moving money around and, and creating sort of an electronic, uh, you know, financial system, even though obviously we're pegged to the dollar and what that, what's backed by that is, is not something digital. But the point is this, we're way behind the eight ball. The ACH system was made in the seventies and it's still what we use. It's 50 years old. So I'm a little skeptical. Again, I'm making the bear case. I'm a little skeptical that Washington, the Fed, whomever is going to champion a move towards digital currency, I'm a little skeptical that it's it's going to move at any reasonable pace. And the fact that the Chinese government is doing so with the swiftness of a hot knife through butter is a little concerning for the status of the dollar as the world currency. So there's there's the bear case. Personally, I don't I don't I don't think we're threatened. That's just my opinion. I think that I think the trust in the dollar, the fact that the tre U.S. Treasury is still the safe haven asset, I think it's really hard to undermine that. But um, you know, I, I do think the digital currency, uh, and I do think the uh, you know, spending like drunken sailors on shore leave is 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 the bear case to uh, to the dollar as the international currency. So, yeah, and I still rather buy gold than a digital coin. So, I don't think we have any other questions here, unless you're seeing something, Rick. Anybody else nope. have a question? Type it in. I see now or never. <laughs> <laughs> as we as we round the four o'clock hour or the five o'clock hour, four o'clock my time. Um, all right, I think it's time to close this, Dan. All right, well, I appreciate everybody attending. Um, we look forward to this every quarter, and and hoping that uh, hoping that you do too. Um, and we'll see you next time. Have a good weekend. Bye bye.